Hello, I'm Chris. I'm a KMP developer, and today I'm going to be shouting at the screen <laughs> uh, uh, about uh, how developers might stop worrying about AI so taking software jobs and learn to profit from LLMs. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'm I'm going to be oh, tech sports coming out Tuesday, and we're closing that soon. So I'm going to be uh, we're going to do a watch along with uh, with my new favorite Internet of Bugs author. Uh, we're almost the same age, and we've actually been in the business this software business about the same amount of time. Now he's been it like looks like the whole damn time and I've taken breaks and did other stuff. So uh and I come in with this different perspective every time. It's like are oh, you guys this is nothing there's nothing new here. This is, we've been talking about this for a long time. But since most of the people who are coming into the computer industry, software industry, they're very young, under twenty five. Um this is like the first cycle and they're like, oh wow, this is brand new. It's like, uh no, they've been saying a lot of this stuff for a long time. And each time they're very, very confident. So confident. This is it. We got it, guys. And it's just been, no, we don't got it. Because humans uh, are very complex creatures. And anyone thinks they can uh, reduce that down to some algorithm is sorely mistaken. Uh, we uh, Humans use algorithms. We create algorithms. We are not algorithms. Okay, we never will be. And let's get into it. Back in the 1990s, because, of course, I have to bring up the 1990s, there was this critique of startup culture as underpants gnomes. The implication was that a lot of startups, a lot of startups, were claiming that they knew where they were going, but they had no actual clue. Basically, it was step one, do a thing, collect underpants, whatever. Step two, question mark, step three, profit. That's right. And the culture that what came, like the startup culture came out of the computer, the computer company, we were just trying to figure out what we could do with these damn things. Like we saw what businesses were doing, like counting and mail lists and all that stuff. But like people our age, like, all right, we're just trying to like, can it do this? Can it do that? We didn't know what it could do. So uh, the underpants collection came out of that mindset of like, what are all the things we can do with it? Let's find out all the things we can do and maybe some of these can make money. And that was kind of how a lot of this stuff started. It's like, you can make money with that? People will pay for that? Like, like, like the initial video games, like the initial people, like the computer people would do the accounting and the mail list. Like, people won't play games on this. That's a ridiculous use of computing power. We had to think of important things like artillery shell uh, trajectories so you can kill people for real. Start home at the time, I was part of the Boston startup community, but I think it's actually more apt as an analogy for the current AI landscape. So we've been through at least yeah, two previous sure. cycles of true AI is just around the corner in the last. Oh yeah, two, at least two. I remember it was one in the 80s, uh, mid 80s, because I was writing uh, expert system AI systems when I was in uh, junior high school on a TRS-80 Model 1. And I showed it to my teacher. He's like, what the hell is this? It identified rocks. You give it, you know, it asks you a series of questions and it would tell you what kind of rock it had. And it came directly from the science class that I had the two weeks prior showing me this checklist of all the things you had to do to figure out what kind of rock you have, igneous or pregnacious or whatever the categories were. I can't remember it now. And I wrote this program that would ask you this, this basically the same set of questions, except it was on the computer. My, my science teacher was like, how did you do this? You got to show me the listing. <laughs> it's like, uh... So that was phase one expert systems. And they came up with this neural network thing. And that was, you know, maybe 10 years, five, seven years later. And it was, this is all bubbling under the surface the whole time. And that was simulating neurons. And they were like, okay, what about the hormones? And what about all these other things? These, these, uh, uh, these subatomic, uh, quantum effects that are those taking a gun. No, we just aggregate that. <laughs> and it's like, oh, I think there was like, might be important somewhere along the lines. Like, how does love calibrate into this whole system of neural networks? Because we're definitely like love is like our, we humans run eighty percent on on emotions. All right, you know twenty percent is the logic, and we justify the emotions with the logic. Okay, so that's a big foible of humans. We think we're logical machines, but we're just backwards, 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 rising. Anyway, I'm rambling. Let's go. Last oh, fifty or so years, and each time it turned out we actually had no clue how to get from what we were working on to where we wanted to go. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. But many people, including me, think that when it comes to general artificial intelligence or AGI. We're still just as clueless as the underpants gnomes. The oh yeah, for sure. This is the thing that I'm really super annoyed about. This because a lot of these, a lot of younger people, a lot of adults have grown up in a sci-fi world, not a science world, a science fiction world where we in these science fiction worlds, these these uh these ultra super intelligence, artificial intelligences are you know all knowing and never valuable. And of course, every story is about how they are, which is kind of funny how humans like these people are like no, we got it this time. We really do. 
<laughs> we figured it out. Artificial gender says, so tell me about the mystical reality that someone goes and sees almost universally when they are administered DMT molecules. So how does that fit into your neural network? You know what I'm talking about? You've never heard of this. Oh, okay. Computer science, you got it all figured out. Oh, right. Let's keep going. The brain, according to experts, is arguably the most complex system that humans are aware of. Now, not everybody yeah. believes this, but there's some links below. And it's without dispute, at least, that our current state-of-the-art LLMs are far, far, far simpler. Far. Like, I don't even, I, I just think, how can we underline this more times? Far, far, far. Like, come on. And the children, I'm sorry, they're children because their minds are childlike, uh, to believe that they can actually create an artificial intelligence that's similar to humans. Are you serious? I, no, there's no way. Stop. And the fact that if they were actually even close to this, our whole reality, our whole world would change so quickly. We would wake up one day and it would, we would all be living in a different reality. We're not seeing that at all. We're not seeing any of that. We're seeing these, these people, these major hype waves of this tub. He goes to this channel in detail about this, about Devin, the software engineer. No, no, you let me try it out. And I'll tell you if it's a software engineer, you don't tell me with your demos if it's a software engineer. And then when you, you release it, it's like, no, it's, that's garbage, total garbage. This, this LLM stuff is a dead end. We've maxed it out. We, I'm going to go into detail about um, next video, maybe this one, how we've already maxed it out. We've already maxed it out. So keep, keep going. Stop waffling. Then what we know of the human brain, and we don't understand a lot of the human brain, and the human brain is the only We don't understand any of it. Stop with we don't understand a little bit. We don't start. See, this is where I kind of take off from these guys that are the, still science-minded. I, I love this guy, but. We, we know none of it. We know none of it. <laughs> we think we know some of it. We don't know any of it. Far, far simpler than what we know of the human brain. And we don't understand a lot of the human brain. And the human brain is the only thing we know that can generate human level intelligence. So the right. It's the only thing we know. This little thing up here, this brain, all of our aggregate group of all these things. It's not just our brain, right? It's everybody's brain because it's all social. It's all based on education, finance. Like those, all these things are not really separate things. These are all just one big human activity. Oh, and you're going to simulate that on a digital computer? Really? Is that what you're going to do? Okay. The idea that a really simple, relatively speaking, LLM will be able to create human level intelligence, I'm kind of skeptical. Uh, they can simulate sort of parts of it, the parts that aren't super that important and could be like interpreted like the Eliza effect. If you don't know what the Eliza effect is, this is the most dangerous stuff with this LLM stuff. The fact that you think you're coming through the typing thing with the screen, the way your brain, your ultra, it's hyper science, hyper intelligent brain because you're not just yours, it's all these other people's intelligence. You th it's your interpretation of what the digital signals are coming through on the screen. That's the intelligence, not the, the text being predictably programmed by a big predictive statistic engine. That's called the Eliza effect. And that's the thing that most freaks me out is not that people are trying to make these machines seem like they can talk. It's that people are believing it. And, the, and they forget that like, these machines are programmed by other people, trained by other specific sets of data, not other sets of data. This is not a neutral set of data, the set of data that this group of people has. Okay, so what the results are, are also tuned. So you're not getting the truth. Where is this, uh, uh, this uh, idea of like, independent truth it's all subjective when it comes to these llms all of it so that's why it's not agi because you won't have it will never change its opinion based on, based on talking to you we people that's one of the experience is like can we can we, can we to change this no it will never change the opinion. so it's not even close it's not even the same trajectory this is a this is a tyrannical system will end up uh if people take it seriously and people think it's a sci-fi thing it's neutral and independent we will doom society. I'm sure this has happened before where people have puppet shows, the masters set up these puppet shows and people believe the puppet shows and then to their doom. The, I, I think this is, the, this is the one of the major things that makes societies fail is this idea that there's some uh, subjective truth. There's some, some way we can offload it to some other authority who will tell us what to do. No, no, never. Critical about that. And in addition, the human brain is able to incorporate feedback almost continuously. Whereas LLMs, even the ones that can go and look at the internet at the moment, their networks are frozen at the time of training. Right, which is why you can never convince them that their opinion and their stance may be wrong. Even if you can logically show that, you will, they, will, they will never admit it. 
So it's not a, it's not even close to being a learning thing. It's not even close. It's just text prediction. Sorry. Because of those two factors, at least, uh, although there are a lot of others, a lot of people, including me, don't believe that LLMs are the last step on the way to human level intelligence. Dev, it's a sidestep. In fact, the whole the whole going after this AGI thing is a complete fa fallacy. But the last underpants gnome question eventually got answered, right? So a lot of startups failed in the late 90s and early 2000s. But what came out of that was e-commerce and internet targeted advertising, which turned out to be useful, although... Okay, we want markets. Humans love markets, man. We like to sell stuff, and if we can do it cheaper and easier, we can sell a lot more stuff because a lot more people can get involved because the cost of entering and being on the market is cheaper. That's why the internet blew up, dumb dumb. Like a lot of things, there have been some downsides. Like e-commerce... Not in the... I'm just... Sorry, I take the dumb dumb back. He's not... This guy's actually pretty smart. But that's... It's it's sort of like uh, this autistic... This guy's on the autistic spectrum for sure. I am too, but like... He's on more on the technology side because he has been embedded in this whole industry for the whole time. And I've taken steps out. I've like stepped out and done that. I was a massage therapist. I did was a yoga instructor. I did all kinds of weird shit. I built my own I rebuilt my own house. I was doing all kinds of other stuff. So I've got a little bit more like integration and kind of what see. So he still thinks it's oh, we just made a market out of it. It's like, uh, no, that's kind of what humans do. Sorry, sir. Uh so that he's hyper intelligent in one area and like deficient in other areas so and we, as we all are commerce the llms we have now despite some issues are genuinely widely useful right predictive text has been useful for a long time yeah okay but it's not intelligent stop and they have some really useful applications so i think that for the current ai cycle we might have a step two not for agi but when it comes to how we might be able to provide economic value and actually generate profits. Agree. So I use Copilot daily is how I produce these iOS versions of these apps. I didn't know anything about iOS. I barely even looked into how iOS works. iOS works. I looked at some example code. I kind of know what I need to do. And I asked Chat GPT or Chat uh, Copilot to fill out the rest of the stuff for me. I'm telling it what to do. It's not telling me what to do. I'm telling it how to do it. It's different. I'm, it's goal focused. And a lot of times it's completely wrong, but sometimes it's right. And it's easier than going and going to Stack Overflow, or whatever, and going through the docs and going through some random guy's interpretation, his story about his mother, and all that. Okay. It's just quicker. But still, I am in charge. I have to go check it to see if it actually works. This is a, this is a cheap shot with this co pilot. Well, oh, it could like be this. It could like be that. It, could, it might be this. The hallucinations. Come on, guys. The fact that it hallucinates at all is just like, no, we're not even close. Because if it was actually real, it would have its own IDE. It would have my code. It would try out the example that it's about to tell me if it actually works or not. That's how it would be, Nick. If it did that, yes, maybe I'd be a little more to change my mind. But we're not even close to that. Not even close. And by we, I mean a lot of us, not just the open AIs and the anthropics of the world. Although big companies like Amazon grabbed a huge share of e-commerce, a whole bunch of other companies benefited from the rise of that ecosystem too. Right, they just made a platform that... And they drove the cost down, which is actually how capitalism is supposed to work. So all these people who, sorry, didn't have access to the marketplace before now have access to a marketplace and they can try their hand. And if they're substantially better than the, their competitor, then they'll survive. But it's like in capitalism. And if they're not, they won't. Sorry, that's just how it goes. And Amazon, they're the ones that said, hey, there's a big market here. We can do the, the, the ground layer for this whole operation. Other people can do it too. Why aren't they? Who knows? Well, you know why? It was, you know, Amazon got favor from the government, so it's we're in a fascist system, so the corporates and the governments are all in cahoots with each other and making sure that competition is, stays away, so one player can become... It's a, it's a game that all societies play. This is it. But those two things are tied together. As long as we're listening to the hype and we believe that AGI is just around the corner and all of the jobs are about to go away and be replaced by AI, there's no incentive to try to apply any of this, and there's no path to profit. Right. I think that's when people are saying, well, the AI took us jobs. Well, AI is like potentially taking our jobs, right? So all these people are like, well, we just wait for it to be a little bit better. Look, here's the thing. If it was going to get a lot better, it would already be getting better. They would use this. If they had found some sort of path to AGI, they'd already be using it to make things alter. And our reality would look completely different very quickly, like a couple weeks. It would completely revamp our whole society. Uh, maybe for the best, maybe for the worst. Mm? <laughs> That's the risk you take if you let an artificial general intelligence actually do what they say it's going to do. But people are like, oh, let's hold off because they're seeing these advances. They haven't been paying attention to how much come, LLMs had come 
along the whole way until you know copilot just came on the scene and uh chat gpt had come on the scene so they had a, an easy access free access to this stuff that didn't require all kinds of technical knowledge so that was the first like people's first introduction they thought oh wow it's amazing but is it really i mean in my experience it, it's it's more useful than going on stack over overflow but it only knows about stuff that's like well known and even then it's a who snake so it's like it's marginal usage for me it was been useful but for the stuff i already know like it's like a nice shortcut those shortcuts and i can look at my code and repetitive tasks yeah it's pretty cool but like in general it's better than not i'm paying for it but it's not easy out it's not even close keep going in order for us to get to the part where we start using the current LLM technology to actually get stuff done, we have to give up on AGI and we have to get past the hype cycle. Exactly. All right. So there's still you. I, I agree 100% with this guy. The stuff that we, the LLMs do, it can be useful. Like you can take your whole, like, take a whole huge load of customer service type inquiries and take it completely off your, off your hands and semi automate it. Like, at least you don't have to have 10 people in customer service. You can have four or three. Uh, uh, but not one. I don't. I mean, I guess the scale it depends on the scale, right? So yes, we can use it for that stuff, and it will be useful. But people, I think there will be a premium. People, will, there's going to be people who want to pay a premium for actual human contact. So there'll be services that have a human contact, and you're going to pay more for that service. That's you know, okay, that's just how it goes. Because few people will invest in building something now if ChatGPT five or six is going to make it irrelevant in a year or two. And even if we did build something now that's useful, few businesses, if any, are going to be willing to try to adopt that thing if it turns out that ChatGPT 5 or 6 is likely to make that irrelevant in a year or two. Agreed. Agreed. And I think that's that's the point where why we're, why we're seeing a lot, well, also the zero interest, Z, Z, ZERP, zero interest rate environment, uh, you know, where those interest rates were super low for such a long time, made it, taking risks on all these crazy companies made sense. But now people have to be more more careful. And I agree that there's there can be a lot of businesses still made on these technologies, but uh, and people need to stop thinking that there's AGIs around the corner and stop believing that's hype wave because if it was already like this, if they actually even had it close, we'd see things radically change because the people in power would use it for their own purposes and they would unleash it uh, to change society in their own image. And once that happens, they're not going to be a public disclosure. It's just going to happen. You're going to, it's all of a sudden you're going to see a, a hover car go by. And the robots are going to come up to your door and say, here's your food allotment for the month. It'll be like that. <laughs> what are you talking about? It's like, food allotment? What are you talking about? Uh, we'll be back and you can't have any more kids. We're going to come back and sterilize you. Oh, really? So today I'm going to try to make two cases. I'm going to try to make the case that it's time for software developers and software companies to both reject the AGI hype and start at least planning for a profitable phase two. Yeah, we can make money on these things. I, this is this is this is the, the key key. Key takeaway, forget AGI. Stop thinking the thing's going to take away your job. It's not going to, it's going to be used to enhance other parts of applications. Uh, and we're, I can't, I kind of see in, like, we're seeing the limits of it now. And you, I'll get into it a little bit more about why I think that we actually might be at the end, complete end of the LLM hype as well. The comments on this video are going to be. F <laughs>
technology adoption has is this S curve here. And people like, where they see down here, it's like, oh, look at this. Like, it's a pretty good match for exponential, except right here. It breaks. It's like, this is the time when you, whatever thing you just invested in the hype wave, time to sell. <laughs> which is a fantastic explainer of YouTube channel. Again, link to the full video below. This is the video that explains about logistic curves. We know that our current AI models can't grow forever because nothing can grow forever. We know that we'll run out of resources at some point. The thing is, we don't know what resource we'll run out of first. We won't know what the limiting factor is until we actually hit it. Now, it's possible we'll start running out of the critical resource very soon. It's possible we already have and just don't know it yet. It's actually possible that a few people know it, but they aren't admitting it to the public yet. There's an article that came out the day after the Ezra Klein interview was posted, detailing evidence that LLMs are already reaching a point of diminishing returns. We're throwing more and more resources at LLMs, but the benchmarks just... Yeah, look here, okay. Wow, we're going by exponential. Oh, well, not quite exponential. Oh, geez. Aren't going up commensurately. That article linked to this paper from last month, showing since 2012, the median doubling time for effective compute is 8.4 months with a 95% confidence interval of 4.5 to 14.3 months. This graph from that paper shows that basically every eight months or so, models are getting roughly twice as efficient. Note, this graph is log scale, so a straight line down to the right indicates an exponential reduction. This is a graph I made of the same data. It's the same data as the previous graph, only I'm not using log scale. I'm using smaller dots so you can see better. And I put a trend curve in there that was just added by Apple's number spreadsheet. So answering a question in 2023 should have taken roughly half as many resources as it took to answer that same question in 2022, and roughly a 16th as many resources as four years earlier in 2019. But here's a graph from another resource. It shows that since mid-2019, improvements on the multitask language understanding benchmark have been linear, not exponential. Oof. There goes your exponentials. Oof. This is a harsh one for you AI fanboys. AGI fanboys. Ouch. Ouch. We're not getting... We're not going to get there, guys. Sorry. So we decrease the amount of effort we're expending, and that decreases exponential, but the benchmark improvement that we're getting for it is only linear. And that disconnect between the exponential and the linear suggests there might be some other factor that's limiting our efficiency. And we might actually know what it is. So Google did an experiment in 2022 with a model called Chinchilla. There's a paper presented at the World AI Alignment Forum that breaks down the implications of that. Chinchilla found there's a sweet spot between the amount of data a model is trained on, the number of tokens, and the number of parameters it has. It seems to show that past this optimal ratio, if you throw more compute at the same size data set, it just doesn't increase functionality, it just wastes resources. So... so. End of hype wave? No? Maybe. The chinchilla paper is right, then the number of tokens is a limiting factor. And if that's true, how close are we to running out? Last month, the 2024 Stanford Annual AI Index Report came out. There was a four-page special section called, Will Models Run Out of Data? And it started on page 26. Of course, no mention of running out of data makes it to any of the key takeaways or summary or anything that you would know if you just read the first few pages. And I want well, I think he was talking about running out of training data, like good data we can train these things on. Uh, I wonder why that is. Actually, I don't wonder why that is at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we don't have enough to train these things sufficiently. That section references a paper from Epic AI that estimates we could run out of high quality language stock in the next year. If we That's why Reddit got sold so we can mine Reddit for real human interactions. <laughs> we haven't already. In addition, there's a crisis of data quality. Several papers have shown an effect called model collapse, which happens when a model is trained on LLM generated data. Over time, becomes like having a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy, if anybody on YouTube even knows what a photocopy is anymore. But it causes the data to become more and more and more similar. And right, so when you do a photocopy, it doesn't actually do a digital copy. It does an analog copy. And every time it does an analog copy, it loses a little bit of information along the edge. And if you've ever seen that copy of that, that Superman guy, it's like starts off all glowy and then it ends up all super contrasting and dark. Yeah, eventually the photocopy gets all contrasty and dark, so it's like black and white dark areas and you can't really t tell what was originally there. It was a cool like artistic effect, but it's annoying when you're actually trying to do a copy of something. If you've got too many copies coming, like if you do a copy of a copy of a copy, like in the old cassette days or, uh, uh, or even vinyl days, um every every progressive generation gets worse and worse that's why the whole digital thing was like amazing because you could copy it a billion times it's the same exact data so go ahead and all of the interesting stuff to go away and eventually it just kind of converges on boring there's a graphic that kind of displays that now we don't know for sure yet that the data problem is going to be the limiting factor but evidence points to that and we should find out before too long now we're still going to get a gpt5 one of these days but if this evidence is correct it's not going to be the dramatic increase that the hype has led many to believe closer to home talking to the developers out there the running out of data problem is even worse for code generation if training data is the bottleneck the improvements in code generation are going to slow down even more because there are orders of magnitude more english tokens available on the internet than there are available tokens from human written source code right and there's already evidence that code generation isn't all that it's claimed to be so github produces yeah it's not I don't think it ever will. It's just too hard. It's just, it's just uh, the, the problem space and the number of steps to get it so humans are actually find value in it. It's just too much, too complicated for a machine to even, I don't even know how you would start to do it because there's conversations, it's subtleties, it's taste, it's nuance, it's, it's a curation. It's, it's not just the stuff you add, it's the stuff you take away and don't even put there at all. 
or the sequence of where you showed. It's all that stuff. It's and you're trying to communicate human needs and human desires. Let me see. He's like, what do you mean by that? Study in 2022 that showed that programmers were 55% faster when they were using AI, which is cool. But with two more years of GitHub Copilot data, a new paper shows that AI-generated code creates a downward pressure on code quality. That paper, which is from GitClear, shows that AI-generated code has a much higher likelihood of being reverted or rewritten within the first two weeks. It's a metric they call code churn. There are other. Yeah, I think if it's junior people who are trusting that this machine has written code that's used that's usable and like fits in with other stuff and is makes sense. Yeah, if you don't know how to see if that is a, is a thing or not, that's cool. Yeah, of course, it's going to be, yeah, throw that stuff away. If you're leveraging people's uh, ability to not know things, they're never going to be as, you're never going to, because of the hallucination effect, these chat GPTs, until it can go like check its solution before it gives it to you, which is, would be amazing. Uh, that we're not, it's always going to be off because there's a bunch of ways of doing stuff. Third quality metrics that are a problem, uh, copy, paste, repeating, that kind of stuff. But the code churn one is really bad. So just a quick recap. We know that. Yeah, it's almost like, okay, is this, is this actually helping? So I think for medium level engineers, I think a chat GPT kind of uh, code, code pilot generation thing makes sense because it'll level you up. In some ways it also like, you also know not what, what doesn't make sense. But for junior, I think it just fucks them up. Growth must be limited on something. The chinchilla experiments imply that something might be data. High quality data is running out or has already. There's evidence that general LM progress has dramatically slowed recently, increasing only linearly since 2020. Code generation has orders of magnitude less data that requires more correctness in English. And we're already seeing evidence of AI reducing general code quality. And if all that turns out to be correct, in many ways, that's really good for business. And it's good for us, the developers. Yeah. So we've been living in a world where... Yeah, this is all good. This is all good news, by the way. No one really wanted to invest in building software products around LLMs that would apply to business problems because everybody believed that the LLMs would be twice as good next year, so they might be able to handle the business problem on their own, and you would have wasted your time and money. Exactly. Exactly. So the hype wave about, oh, we'll just, you're going to just replace the software engineers, like, really? The fact is they're not going to, and then people are going to realize, oh, we got took again. And they're going to go, oh, we got to go hire people, otherwise they're going to hire somebody else who's figured this out before we did, so we just get on... Get on board. So for software engineers, this is really great news, by the way. Funny. Once it becomes clear that the growth is becoming just incremental, then it will be time to apply LLMs to real-world problems. And that means writing software to interface between the LLMs and the business issues. Right. Based on the code quality data from GitClear, we're still going to need plenty of programmers. Those programmers might be able to create code a little faster with AI, but since the AI-generated code seems to require a lot of rework, it might be fine for one shot, let's get the answer and throw the code away problems, but not for code that needs to be maintained long-term. So I'm guessing the next few years, maybe three to five, there are going to be a lot of people that are going to be taking the LLM models and they're going to be wrapping non-AI functionality around them to specialize them for specific yeah. use cases. Yeah, yeah. This is going to be a thing kind of the way Devon, or at least the open source versions like Davika and Open Devon that work about as well as Devon, but we can actually look under the code and see how they work. Those systems are an LLM, but with a browser module plugged in and a terminal module and a planning module and a reporting module and some expert systems around it that kind of tell it what to do. That kind of system can be applied not just to, you know, let's pretend to be an AI engineer, but it can also be applied to all kinds of business problems. Right. And I think the business problems that are more not creating something new but going on you trying to adhere to a procedure that's already been designed by humans i think that is the use case that's a great use case for that lm stuff but creative stuff like creating trying to create something new i think this you're gonna have to have humans that really understand how this stuff works and getting a good ml engineer that works with a devon that knows how to do what do the stuff with devon that's just an, okay you're back to software engineering again with a, a little bit of more enhanced. that's why i'm into this kmp stuff is because we can uh, leverage these code pilot stuff and and, and leverage uh, a one one developer and have multiple multiple uh, targets. You can have JavaScript, iOS, Android, uh, uh, desktop, all with one code base. Uh, and leveraging that to have one engineer create those kinds of things. Yeah, that that I think is makes more sense than having to try and just create the whole thing uh, from and, and not not have to understand what's going on underneath. <laughs> Now, I think we're I think we're at least 30 years away from that. The same way that 2008 to 2012 or 2014, something in there, was a lot about taking existing stuff like websites and then converting them to become mobile apps. 2024 to 2027 or 2029, something like that, might be taking a lot of existing things, services, software, apps, websites, that kind of thing, and reforming them around the capabilities of LLMs. Yeah, yeah. So so going into the documentation and searching stuff, you ask LLM, it's like, that's expert in whatever thing you're trying to do, whatever service you're going into whatever eBay thing, it'll just go look for you as opposed to you doing this manual search for yourself and it'll do the more of the front end, it'll do more of that work for you. So I think that is that is a good use case for it. It feels to me now a lot like 2008. The first Apple App Store had just been announced and we thought we could make money from it, but we weren't quite sure. And the economy was kind of illiquid because the mortgage bubble had just popped and we were in the beginnings of the Great Recession. At the moment, it seems like generative AI is going to be a money waker, but we're not quite sure and the economy is kind of liquid because interest rates are still really high. If when that settles, we could just well be off to the races.
Am I right? No idea, but we should know soon. We've heard a lot recently about how ChatGPT5 is supposed to be a huge leap, and it's supposed to be released as early as this summer. There's a link to that in the notes below. If we don't get an exponentially better ChatGPT5 this year, then hopefully people will start recognizing that it's time to change from let's wait for better LLMs to let's take the current LLMs and let's start applying it to real-world problems. And if we can do that, that will be a phase two that we can live with. Remember, yeah, yeah. the internet is full of bugs. Anyone who tells different is probably trying to sell you some stupid AI service. Let's be careful out there. <laughs> let's be careful. I don't know. That would be a little dangerous. Uh, okay, so we're... Hold on here. Oh, my God. All right, I just want to bring up this uh, from the Daily Blob, which I uh, somewhat guys is kind of annoying, but sometimes he brings good news. So and so, I think this is an interesting story. Basically, as we start to see the AI bubble collapse, at least to a certain degree. So one of the things with AI is basically AI is a concept that has been massively overhyped. Again, much of what we're looking at is not AI; it's large language models. That's an entirely different critter. And but the problem is, is again, investors are looking for places to throw their money. So AI is the sexy new thing, and so they've been throwing a lot of money into the AI world. The Right, so so it looks like this thing is popping already. When companies are talking about selling this soon in the cycle, when we're almost on the verge of advanced general intelligence. Okay, the fact that they're trying that these companies are doing the, the stable diffusion AI generate geek. It was generated already wanting to sell it. Problem is, is AI is like anything else. It's, a, it's its own little niche in the industry and it requires its own resources. One of the problems for AI, investing in AI, is the main resource it needs is ridiculously expensive hardware, right? So here's the thing, right? If you're trying to create the next Facebook or whatever, uh, and you can use AWS services, you're going to create the next uh, you know, Instagram or whatnot, you can use you know, something like AWS or whatever, some kind of cloud services. You swipe your credit card or you swipe your investor's credit card. And the reality is, the most expensive thing for your company uh, is going to be the people, right? Again, engineers cost money, HR people cost money, designers cost money, that type of thing. Well, here's the deal is that if you're a good founder, you can, you can sell your or dream, right? You can actually pay employees with passion. Let me be clear. If you're an employee, never accept passion. <laughs> but if you're a founder, I mean, you okay. can sell it all day long. You should the make hundred. It's like, you should make $150,000 a year. You're a great, wonderful employee. I can't afford it though. Why don't I give you 50 with equity, right? And so that's the thing. If you have... Um, a human, right, a programmer type, uh, intensive a startup that you're creating, the reality is, is you literally can pay people with passion with the idea that going into the future, if the company explodes, which obviously it will, obviously you're going to the moon, then they'll all become rich bastards, right? The value of that, though, is that you really don't have to spend any money, right? You don't have to get any additional investor money. You don't have to get any additional revenue. You can basically just pay these people peanuts, uh, again, try to sell them on the idea of equity, and then hopefully later everything goes well. And if it doesn't, you can just back up your bags and leave them. Uh, the issue, though, is with AI, AI, here's the thing. What, what I kind of appreciate about GPUs, you know what I really appreciate about the GPUs? The GPUs don't give a damn about your passion. They don't give a damn about your passion. They don't give a damn about your story or your narrative. Or what you're gonna do? GPUs are just GPUs. You can either buy them or you can't buy them. And GPUs don't care, right? And so the thing is, with these GPUs, they're incredibly expensive. Uh, uh, the new NVIDIA GPUs are forty thousand dollars a pop. Servers with the NVIDIA GPU. It has stable diffusion. So stable diffusion is a model for order to create images. So again, you go back to 2023. Everybody was talking about stable diffusion. They got like $100 million in investor money. And now they're probably going to die because that's how the tech world works. Uh, the maker of stable diffusion is collapsing considering sale. Uh, Stability AI, the maker of the popular AI image generator, stable diffusion is in big financial trouble. As the information reports, the startup is facing a severe cash crunch and in talks of being sold off. It's a major fall from grace. During the early days of the AI race, former CEO Imad Mostique uh, raised $100 million for the venture at a $1 billion valuation in 2022. So a year and a half ago, this company is worth a billion quote unquote worth a billion dollars. Uh, but the company has been bleeding cash ever since with wages and expenses on computing power greatly exceeding revenue, right? And so that's one of the problems too with these valuations is even though your value to that, you've only got this amount of money, so you only have a hundred million dollars. Again, you hire a lot of coders. Again, those coders are expensive. You buy a lot of hardware. It's it's amazing how you can burn through a hundred million dollars. It's it is a whole different level. Like you real So I just want to say that the AI bubble has probably popped and um yeah it's time to start using it. Oh I got a little leak there. Portal leak. <laughs> All right. If you like and subscribe, talk to you soon.